Water waving sword flailing Jingju. Water waving sword flailing Jingju. Water waving sword flailing Jingju. Hi, we're Jinx and Tuner, owner and operators of Jinx and Tuner's water waving sword flailing Jingju warehouse and emporium. Thanks to a banner poll, we're currently overstocked on water waving sword flailing Jingju's, and we're passing these polls on to you. Attract customers to your business. Make a splash at your next presentation. Keep grandma company. <laughs> hey everyone, it's Jinx and I'm a Genshin Impact Math Guy now. The uh, opening gag was Tuner's idea, so be sure to go shoot him a follow over at twitch.tv slash Tuner if you want to see him stream Genshin almost every day. We do share revenue, so any support you give to either him or me does support both of us. So I did want to do this video like a week ago, but because of various reasons, linked to a video above explaining exactly what happened, I was not able to work on videos for like 4 days. In this video, we are going to be talking about how strong Jingchu is and why you should get him right now on banner, even though there's only a day left. Again, I apologize, I wanted this out like a week ago, but it just wasn't doable until now. I did explain exactly what happened in a previous video, link in the top right in the description to that. And also, for the sake of getting this out as soon as possible, I am going to do very minimal editing, so it's really just gonna be me talking over background footage. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of why Jingchu is such a potent 4 star character that, in my opinion, outperforms over half the 5 stars in the game, I do want to just quickly preface this by even though I am saying you should get him if you're able to, if you cannot afford to make polls, do not spend money you cannot afford. This is a game, it's supposed to be entertainment, it's not supposed to affect your actual life negatively. However, if you do have the disposable income to make more polls or you have saved up Prima Gens, here's why you should pull for Jingchu. Jingchu is, with caveats, in my humble opinion, the strongest 4 star in the game at any phase of the game in basically every team composition. In my personal 4 star power rankings, I place him right next to Bennett as strongest 4 star in the game in general. And yes, Razor, Fischl, Beidou, and Sucrose are also up there. I'll be doing a video in the future talking about these 4 stars and why they're better than basically every character in the game, including half the 5 stars. Guys, 5 stars aren't that great with the exception of Klee, Deluk, Kei Ching, as well as Venti. I am fighting a level 6 weekly wolf in the background footage right now. And my team is composed of a level 70 Bennett, two level 60s between Jingchu and Zhang Ling, and then my Sucrose is only level 40. And because Bennett's my carry, he's the only one with a stacked artifact set. My Jingchu is outputting these numbers, and he only has a plus 20 Hydro Cup and a plus 16 Feather. Everything else is plus 0. Admittedly, my Jingchu, Zhang Ling, and Sucrose do have a few constellations on them, which does probably increase their overall output by roughly 30 to 20 percent or so, but still, look at the values on screen. And yes, my Bennett's constellation zero, I haven't gone to one in a shop yet because I'm saving my pulls for child. And my Zhang Ling and Sucrose are both running very minimally upgraded sets for Venera and Witches respectively. And I also don't use any 5-star weapons on either of my accounts because I find it biases my understanding of good team comps too much. And the only level 80 weapon I have is my Black Sword on Bennett. Every other character in this team is running a level 60 or level 50 weapon. You do not need 5-stars to have good teams in this game. You just need to understand how to build good teams as well as understand how to funnel resources efficiently into your teams. Again, future video talking about that and also the next masterclass to come out is going to be about how to build team comps and how to get effective cheap deeps. Keep in mind, I did eat a perfect Adeptus Temptation for this background footage because real talk, what else are you going to use them on other than weekly bosses? You can't eat food in the Abyss. Now, I will be discussing Jing Chu's strengths and power level. However, I will only be scratching the surface of his depth. For any of the information I don't cover in this video, like artifact sets, etc., be sure to check out the translated Jing Chu handbook for everything you have ever wanted to know about this wet femboy. Direct link to the translated Jing Chu handbook will be in the description. And one final thing about terminology changes, so I am no longer going to be calling characters like Jing Chu a sub-carry, I'm going to be calling them reaction supports. This is the EN term versus the CN term, and the reason I'm switching it is because sub-carry has suddenly become a bit confusing now that double-carry teams like Dayluke plus Bennett teams have kind of become a thing. So moving forward, I'm just going to call them reaction supports because it's a little bit clearer. So if you ever hear me say the term sub-carry in a previous video, that's what I mean when I say reaction support. I'm also going to be referring to Jing Chu's potency as a burst support. A burst support is basically just a support who comes on the field, presses a button or two, and adds a bunch of damage value to the team. 
Also, if you watched my previous videos, you've heard me refer to motion value before. I'm going to start referring to that from now on as talent damage percentage. This talent damage percentage is what is listed under your talent details of how, what percent of your attack that your ability deals in damage. In Monster Hunter World and fighting games, this is called a motion value. However, simply calling it a talent damage percentage is going to be more consistent with the in-game names. So I'm going to try to transition into saying that instead of motion value. And finally, I'm going to be referring to Jing Chu's elemental skill and elemental burst a lot. So if I ever say E, that's the button for elemental skill. If I ever say Q, that's the button for his ult. All right, so now that we're getting into the real nitty gritty of why you should get Jing Chu, allow me to summon all of my past experience selling several hundred dollar bottles of wine to guests at the various restaurants I've consulted that in the past and explain to you why XQ should be something you get today before the bandit goes away, assuming you can afford it. So point number one, he is the best reaction support in many of the best team comps for the best carries in the game. This means he pairs fantastically with many of the courses, I mean many of the characters that you might be enjoying eating tonight, I mean you might be running. If you run him with Deluke, Klee, or Bennett, you suddenly have a very potent Vaporize team where he is making all of their abilities and a lot of Klee's basic attacks and charge attacks deal 50% more damage just because they're wet. Now you may be wondering, why don't we go for a melt comp on Klee specifically, after all that's 2 times damage instead of one and a half times damage. And that's because functionally right now there is not a single cryo support in the game that can keep up with Klee's fire application. In fact, I have run a Chi Chi and Kaya with Klee and they still cannot keep up with the pyro application, so it ends up melting their cryo attacks instead of Klee's actual damage. However, Jing Chu's ult on its own keeps up with Klee and allows her to vaporize a lot of her damage outputs. Now, I will be testing Klee with Deona when she comes down 1.1, but I'm not really convinced she's gonna have the cryo application to keep up with Klee still. In addition, for Deluke and Bennett specifically, you can mix in a Chong Yun support to convert them to cryo damage so you freeze, shatter, and also melt them all the time. That being said, if you exclude Jing Chu in a De Luke and Chong Yun melt comp, you can fit in normally a Bennett and a Venera support, which is a bit more output, but you lose the crowd control from freezing enemies. If you combine him with a Chong Yun carry or a Razor carry, suddenly you have access to a free Shatter comp, which is a lot more damage, additional CC, and in the case of Chong Yun specifically, is his most powerful comp. And if you mix him with Kei Ching, you obviously have a very potent Electroshock team. Now, currently, the way Electroshock works is actually bugged, and Mahoyo has confirmed they're going to be changing that in 1.1. So the actual amount of investment you need to make an Electroshock team work in terms of investing in your Jing Chu may change in 1.1. We'll be testing it when it comes out. The point is, simply by Jing Chu's ult existing, these carries suddenly get so much extra damage added to their standard combo rotations and basic attacks just on raw virtue of him making things wet constantly. Really, the only carry that I do personally consider god tier that doesn't synergize well with him is Zhang Ling. The issue is because Zhang Ling is a physical carry that can neither provide either the electro or the cryo you want for the superconduct you need on physical teams, Jing Chu will unfortunately oftentimes eat up the cryo and electro supports elements with his water because he applies it so fast. This makes the superconduct uptime on a Zhang Ling team with a Jing Chu kind of iffy unless you intentionally are very good at making sure you apply Superconductor intentionally, but that is a lot more micro-intensive. And then vaporizing Zhang Ling's abilities isn't super great because they deal low damage per hit and vaporize is an amping reaction, but it is still more damage if, again, you can micro the Superconducts properly. Now, you can't always use him in every team because at the end of the day, in the end game of AR40, AR45+, plus and late game Abyss of 9 through 12, you have to flex your team into different elements appropriate to the content you're facing. He is going to be hard to use in Abyss Floor 12 as well against any kind of Hydro enemy domain because he's Hydro damage, and because he does make himself wet during one instance during every E, he is going to freeze constantly on Abyss Floor 12. He is still usable on Abyss Floor 12, you just have to make sure you're always cleansing him before he ever pops his E. But otherwise, when you aren't flexing your team for different enemy content and Leyline Disorders, but you just want a general clearing team, he adds so much value as a reaction support. Point number two in Jingchu's favor and why you should get him. He is also this best level reaction support at level one. This means that this vintage, I mean Jingchu, is a fantastic, rich, powerful amount of flavor, I mean damage for a fantastic value. This is because, generally speaking, in most compositions, Jingchu is able to be the aura, not the trigger element, so his stats don't matter. Now, if you don't know why him being the aura element character is important, watch our masterclass on elemental reactions and how the elemental 
elemental system works in the game and you'll understand what I'm talking about. For Vaporize teams, he still applies Vaporize to all of the Pyro abilities or to Klee's attacks at level 1 as long as he presses his ult. Interestingly enough, because of the travel time on Klee's attacks and charge attacks, you actually hit with Jing Chu's swords before her attacks do when you're at the correct distances, so you actually get very easy micro to get Vaporize on basically everything Klee does. With a level 1 reaction support. If you use him in a freeze comp, then he's going to be still applying the wet to allow you to freeze, shatter, or melt regardless of whether he's level 1 or not. Now, admittedly, you're probably gonna level him to like at least level 40 so he doesn't get one shot by stuff, but regardless, this is the definition of cheap deeps. Really, the only comp where he won't function at level 1 potency as a reaction support is in Electroshock because currently he does function that way because of a bug, but they're gonna fix that, so we're gonna reassess it when 1.1 comes out. Third point in Jing Chu's favor of why you should get him. In addition to mechanically functioning as a very strong reaction support at level 1, he scales incredibly well with stat investment and is one of the best burst supports in the game when you stack him. So we're gonna go more into how you funnel resources efficiently in the Future Masterclass video, but generally speaking, the order of funneling resources goes you stack your carries first into hyper carry status, you then focus on making sure your healers have sufficient output for your ability to dodge and the damage you take, etc. You then make sure your other supports have their plus zero set bonuses they need to be the kind of strong support they need to be. And then you make sure everyone else has a decent feather and proper elemental damage cup to enhance the damage a little bit more. And then after that, you focus your resources into increasing your burst supports damage outputs. Now, which of these damage supports you choose to then stack a bunch of damage onto depends on which ones get you more rewards for the investments. And in terms of burst support output for investment, the four best in the game currently are Venti, Beidou, Fischl, and Jing Chu. Ning Guang is actually fairly close behind these guys, and she does have very high base values, but because she is Geo, she does trade out potential damage for the ability to make shields. Which is fine, because that's good game balance. Now, as far as I'm aware, these are the four best burst supports in the game currently. But in reality, the only one of these four that generally takes a higher priority for stacking over the Jing Chu in your team is gonna be Venti. If you stack damage on Venti, he literally clears rooms by himself. Beidou can put out a massive amount of burst damage with switch perfect parries every seven and a half seconds, however, you have to get good at switch perfect parries to make her worth using. Now, Official also has a fairly comparable level of output to Jing Chu, however, her reactions are just, in my opinion, much worse. Compared to, like, running Vaporize comps with Jing Chu, generally Official's running Overload comps. These do have a higher potential damage ceiling, however, functionally speaking, Overload is kind of scuffy against non-big opponents. Purely on paper, Overload does output more damage than a lot of other team comps in the game, however, because Overload's do boop away enemies who are smaller, you waste stamina and DPS uptime chasing after enemies. This also makes it incredibly hard to run overload teams with any kind of mechanics in your team that require a small circle area like Chong Yun's E, like Jean's ult, or like Bennett's ult. If you can't tell, I'm not the biggest fan of overload teams because functionally they just play very scuffy. I mean, you still run overload on Abyss Floor 9 because your overloads do three times the damage, but outside of that, I just don't like using them. Now let's talk about how much more damage he he does get with investments. So at Ascension 4, he just straight up gets 20% more Hydro damage additively. This is a big amount of damage, and generally speaking, you leave him at this 60 out of 70 Ascension 4 because leveling up further isn't really worth the investment. And until we get higher level end game content to have to tackle, pretty much all your burst support should be staying at this Ascension 4 60 out of 70. Really, the only characters that should be ever going past this in terms of resource efficiency of investment are your carries. This is because you get very little damage gains from your actual stats from leveling up past 60. But your carries should generally be higher level because there is a part of the damage formula that accounts for the level difference between the enemy and the character doing damage, so the carries doing the majority of the damage on your team should probably be leveled up a bit. While ideally you want to level up your other characters as well, it's just incredibly expensive investment-wise and not worth the damage gains for anything except for your carries. To give you a little bit of context on why it's not really that important for you to level up your characters past this point, the hardest con in the game currently is going to be Abyss Floor 12, where you fight up to level 100 enemies. 
Now, the first time I was ever able to climb to Abyss Floor 12-3, I was running two level 70 carries, two level 60 reaction supports, and then two level 40 supports on both teams. Unfortunately, I never actually got around to clearing 12-3 itself, because by the time I got there, there was an hour left on the reset, and I forgot to bring a second cryo unit for my other team, because by the way, Abyss Floor 12-3 has a level 100 Thunder Fatui on both sides. R.I.P. And yes, I had zero five-star weapons in any of my characters. Now, I have since then leveled up my characters a little bit more, so I at least have another level 60 Ascension 4 in each team. And I am looking to try to get a 9-9 clear of 12-3 this time around. I just haven't been able to find any time to do Abyss. The point is, is that the levels don't matter as much as making sure you're efficiently resource funneling your characters, and increasing your characters' levels who aren't your carry is not efficient resource investments. At least past the point of Ascension 4. This may change in future content, Content, but at the current moment, you don't need it. But yeah, going back to Jing Chu, he just has incredibly good scaling, and the only reason we don't prioritize scaling him before our carries is because his auto attacks fucking suck. At Ascension 4, Jing Chu's E can be talent level 6. This is a talent damage percentage of 235% plus 268% on the second hit. This deals more damage than almost every ult in the game. And at Constellation 4, this gets an additional 50% damage if his ult is active. And at Constellation 5, this gets to level 9 and instead deals 200 186 plus 325 percent without that constellation 4 bonus active this is just ludicrously large amounts of low effort burst my jing chu on my main account regularly hits 5 to 8k on non crits with this ability and he only has a little bit over 800 attack and a plus 20 hydro cup that's it and a level 60 weapon i guess now my jing chu is constellation 5 but even at constellation 0 he still does a very large amount of burst damage every time he presses his e now let's talk about the real money maker his alt so at constellation 6 and level 9, this can potentially deal a max of 5,076.5% talent damage over the 18 seconds. To give you just a general frame of reference for how much damage that is, that is over 4 times the amount of damage that Klee's ult does over its duration. And yes, this does not include the damage output from the Constellation 2 Hydro Resistant Shred. Now, this is assuming that he's only going to be hitting 17 out of the 18 times, because there's a 1 second timer in between each of the rollouts, and it's pretty difficult to consistently get 18 out of 18 out just due to input difference. Now, even at con 0 and just a level 6 version of his ult instead, this still deals a very respectable 2,660 average talent damage percentage over 15 seconds. This is still over twice the amount of damage that Klee's ult does at talent level 6. And again, this assumes you're hitting 14 instead of 15 rotations of your swords. So if his output numbers are this big, but he's still only a 4-star, what are the important caveats? After all, how can he put out this much output and only be considered a 4-star? Well, the answer to that is energy generation and cooldowns. The balancer for the massive burst damage scaling on his E is that it's a 21 second cooldown. When you account for this only being used every 21 seconds, his general DPS is actually pretty average on his E. And then his ult is only a 20 second cooldown, but it does require 80 energy, and until a child comes out, there are just no other Hydra units in the game that can generate a large amount of energy to funnel into him. As we discussed in our previous masterclass talking about energy regeneration mechanics, in the game, same element teammates do give you three times the energy to each other. This means if we do not build our Jing Chu to account for these weaknesses, he's actually got very low uptime on his abilities. And in fact, even if we build Jing Chu with the obvious option of just stacking as much energy region as we can, it still takes an incredibly long time to generate his alts. And even though his C6 does generate energy, it's either bugged or mistranslated. I actually don't have a Constellation 6 Jing Chu, but I have talked to others who have him, and apparently it only generates at most about 20% of his ult recharge over its entire duration. Sounds pretty terrible, right? Well, fortunately, all of these problems are solved by Sacrificial Sword. See, Sacrificial Sword has this passive when you hit something with your E, you have a percent chance to reset the cooldown, which saves you 21 seconds on Jing Chu. On top of that, I am 95 percent sure that this sacrificial passive can proc on either of the hits for Jing Chu's E. So this means that at refinement level 2, you are on average going to get the proc every time you E within the cooldown limits of your sacrificial sword passive. Every time this procs, not only do you do twice the amount of burst damage, you're also going to be regenerating twice as much energy in the same time period. I cannot stress enough how important it is for you to have a sacrificial sword on your Jing Chu if you want to have high alt uptime. Without a sac sword, he is still strong, he's just not at this god tier level of output that I've been explaining in the entire video. 
depending on the refinement on your sacrificial sword, you have the difference between having to wait an extra 21 seconds to get another Jingchu ult or having it up off of cooldown. And this is the nasty caveat because Beidou, Fischl, and Venti do outperform him if he doesn't have a sack sword. But if you have sacrificial sword, he suddenly jumps up to being, in my humble opinion, the best four star in the game. So yeah, go get a Jingchu and maybe also a sack sword if you don't have one and you will have a ridiculous ridiculously powerful burst support as well as a reaction support for your team comps. Again though, only if you can afford to do so. Remember, at the end of the day, this is a game. Alright, that's all I have for this video. The pitch ended up quite a bit longer than I expected, but I did want to go at least somewhat in-depth with explaining everything about Jingchu. Jingchu is one of the most complex characters in the game next to Klee and Kei Ching. Alright, thank you so much for checking out the video as always. If you enjoyed the content and want to help support us, be sure to just like the video, comment, as well as share it with your friends. All of these things push it up in the search algorithm so it gets in front of more faces. And don't forget, Tuna does stream live on Twitch almost every single day. He is still new to the game and learning a lot of stuff and does run Jing Chu in basically all of his compositions. And if you want the most up-to-date information about what's going on with the channel, about what I'm working on, about little interesting Genshin math stuff I found out, be sure to check out our Twitters. The at Jinx Mathless is my personal Twitter and the at Jinx Tuner is going to be the company account run by Tuner. As always, be sure to check out our Discord server, the Mathalos Nest, where we have a beautiful community of people all learning and sharing information with each other. Also a pretty good place to find people if you want to do some monster farming runs with them like we covered in the previous video. Just please be nice and don't be a d We don't want our moderation team who's already working really hard to have to have extra work. And of course, none of this is possible without the generosity of our patrons. Y'all the best. And again, link to the Jingchu translated handbook in the description if you want to see a lot more details about this beautiful wet femboy. Alright, that's all I got for this one. This one was a bit more of a rushed video because I did want to get it out as soon as possible. But if you enjoyed it and want to see the future stuff, then be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and we will let you know as soon as videos come out. Happy waifu hunting whalers, we'll see you in the next one. Bye!